so I would like to welcome you all um, to this seminar with Lancaster University on health economics and policy. Um, there's a few things I'd just like you all to be aware of. Um, I'm aware people are still joining. Um, so we will take a couple of minutes just to allow everybody to um, join and get ready for us to start. Um, as a few of you have already noticed, we've got a poll going um, asking you a couple of questions um, about your studies and about whether you're interested to, to study at Lancaster University. Um, so if you can all take the time to answer those questions, there's only four, so it shouldn't take very long, um, but that would be really useful if you could do that for us. Um, there is also a Q&A box. So if you have any questions throughout the seminar, if you can put them into that box um, and then we will address them at the end and we'll do a Q&A um, with the, the people in this call. Um, also, as with um, a few of you have already noticed it, we have the chat function. So please feel free to say hello and um, get involved in the chat as well. It's always great to see your comments. Um, and last but not least, um, just to mention the certificate that you will receive if you stay for the duration of this seminar. Um, I know that quite a lot of people were very excited and interested in that. Um, so just to let you know that you will have to, to stay for the entirety of the seminar to receive that. And then you'll get that through via email. Um, if you've got any questions about that specifically, please do let us know. Um, but otherwise, that's the the um, boring stuff over with, I suppose, to get you ready for the seminar to start. Um, so first of all, I would love to introduce um, Professor Sia Mateus um, from Lancaster University. She's a professor in health economics. So thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time out to um, teach us about this topic. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here this afternoon. You're very welcome. Um, we also have Kirsten in here um, from the from Lancaster University as well. She's a regional manager. Um, so thank you so much for joining us to help with the Q&A and with all of your knowledge about the university. Hi, everyone. I look forward to looking at your questions and helping answer them later on. Fabulous. Thanks, Kirsten. And last but not least, we have Faras um, from the IEC Abroad team over in Manchester. Um, so he is the Operations and Admissions Manager for IEC Abroad in Edvoy. Um, he will be here to help with the Q&A and facilitate with that and answer any of your questions that you may have. Um, from this point, I think I will pass over to Faras to explain a little bit more about what we do um, before we dive into the seminar. Um, but as I say, if you've got any questions, please put them into the Q&A. And um, yeah, over to you, Faras. Thank you, Katie. Um, first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our first seminar uh, for Lancaster University, organized by IEC Abroad and Edvoy. So I'd like to welcome Professor Siu and uh, uh, Christine uh, from Lancaster University for uh, joining us today. So just a little bit introduction of IEC Abroad and Edvoy. IEC Abroad um, has been uh, helping students for the past 14 years in uh, fulfilling their dreams and uh, joining higher education in the UK, Ireland, and so many other countries. And uh, our new uh, uh, product uh, Edvoy is our new education technology product. So uh, it's been launched recently to help students to uh, fulfill the dreams through technology. And uh, we have uh, global uh, offices in Europe, in the Middle East, India, and in the Far East. So uh, we would like any questions from you guys after the seminar, and we will be happy to help you. So thank you, and uh, I'll pass over to Professor C. Hello, I'm sorry, I was muted. This happens quite frequently in, um, in webinars. We think that we are speaking and we are speaking, but no one is listening to us. So uh, thank you very much for the um, invitation that, was, um, that I received to be here this afternoon to share um, with you 
uh, what um, what we teach in uh, in health economics and what uh, what's relevant um, for for health economics in terms of the the current um, context. So I'm going to share my my screen uh, with you, and I have prepared uh, a small uh, presentation about um, the relevance of um, of health economics um, and why is it so so interesting to to study and to learn more about uh, health economics. So um, I'm going to, to give you a very brief uh, overview about um, health economics and uh, uh, what's um, interesting uh, related to, to health economics. So what's the, um, the interest on, on studying uh, health economics? Well, it is um, mainly um, an applied discipline. Um, this is, um, it analyzes real world and current problems, as I'm sure we are all uh, now aware, uh, because of uh, this uh, recent pandemic. Um, health Sorry, has... Professor, so you just uh, to interrupt, uh, can you just uh, make it a slideshow? so everyone can see the sorry thank you it wasn't working let me see can you see it now better yeah now it's better now Okay, I'm sorry. And health concerns uh, all of us and it provides excellent career opportunities. Don't forget uh, about this. I think that there will be an increased need for people with skills uh, in health economics and, and policy in the next five, uh, ten years. So what um, can be covered in terms of, of research uh, or master's dissertations or PhD dissertations? Well, we can look at how health is um, delivered, how healthcare is delivered in different countries around the, um, the world. So we can look into healthcare systems, we can look into doctor's labor supply, uh, types of organization in, in different settings. We can also look into public health interventions and variations in, um, in medical practice. Um, we also can think about um, the health itself and why do we demand um, health care because is health something we choose? Most of the times it's not, but sometimes we also know that our behaviors lead to improved or worse outcomes in terms of our own health. So, and we can study that and um, develop models of understanding regarding the demand for health and health care, for instance, how sleep patterns interact with health, uh, lifestyle decisions like um, doing exercise or eating behaviors and so on. And all this is part of what we health economists put in the box of demand for health. And then when we get sick, we talk about demand for health care. And it's also um, very relevant to think about um, how do we measure costs and benefits of, of technologies. All health systems in the, in the world um, need to, to make decisions regarding the, the investment of um, scarce resources. So we need to think about cost effectiveness analysis. How can we measure health related quality of life? Uh, what kind of gains are on the table? Uh, how much are we paying for, for the benefit and the health gains that are being proposed. And we can also think about the purposes of uh, economic evaluations because we can think about economic evaluations of new medicines, new medical devices, um, public health interventions, 
social interventions and so on. So there are a lot of um, fields and a lot of topics that can be further covered in, um, in health economics and that uh, we have uh, skills and tools to do uh, an analysis because at the end what um, uh, we all wish is to have an impact in, the, in society and that our research helps to change the world for, for the better. So uh, at the end, um, with the knowledge and research that we do in health economics, we um, aim to support um, better and evidence-based uh, uh, health policies. And um, before we dig into health economics, I think that we need to, to have an overview of what is economics, does economics apply to health and health care, what is health economics and the relevance of, of health economics. And it's important to think about economics because uh, all the characteristics that we observe in the field of economics are also um, relevant in the field of, of health economics. Um, economics is the, the study of how society uses scarce resources to produce valuable commodities and distribute them among different people. And here we have two ideas that are crucial in health economics. One is that goods are scarce because they, they, they are finite. And the other one is that society must use its resources efficiently. And this is a tension that is present in, um, in all of the countries, I, I would dare to say, because um, it's, um, we need to do the most with the scarce resources that we have. And at the same time, we need to make choices in order to use those resources in the most efficient way. And economics, uh, it's not only about money. Most of the times economists are seen as people that only care about money and savings. And it's not like that. Because when we talk money is just a currency that is used as a, a measure of value and as a mechanism for exchange between economic agents. And especially in the, in the field of, of health economics, there is much more to be valued that, um, that money. Uh, and um, economics it's, isn't only applied to goods that are exchanged in the market and that we have a price for it. For instance, um, if you work in the healthcare sector or if you have ever been sick or something like that, um, you know that um, blood transfusions or transplants are really important. And also this isn't a price. So we also need to, to, to have uh, an overview of um, uh, how to um, apply health economics to goods or to services where we don't have a price in the market or where the market doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And economics is not only done by economists, it is included in our everyday lives and in all the decisions that we make during the day. For an economist, I think it's easier to think about uh, what we are doing and to see that within the framework of, of economics, it's more difficult for someone outside the field, but it's uh, every day we make consumption choices. So every day we act as, um, uh, as an economist. And um, of e economics is not all, also uh, only about accountancy. So it's not only about uh, keeping the um, the, the books balanced. It, it's about much more than um, that, that, than that, and um, isn't only about um, uh, the reduction of costs. Uh, to reduce costs is a goal for an end. Um, uh, sorry, it's, it's uh, a mean for an end in, because the, what we really wish is to achieve greater efficiency. But um, what is relevant for for health economics is always to have um, a view of the costs but at the same time have the costs um, related to the benefits that can be uh, achieved by uh, society as a whole. So now I'm going to, to speak a bit about the 10 principles of, of economics and um, um, I'll speak uh, about the ones 
that are relevant for, um, for the field of health economics. And uh, I'd like to, to start by uh, talking a bit about the word economy. And it's, it's a word that comes, um, that had its origin in the Greek, economos, and oikos means house, and nomos means law or rule. So economy is the study of one who manages a household. And when we talk about the country or when we look at the bigger um, units, we are just uh, looking at the aggregated behaviors of more people, or as an economist would say, more agents in the, in the market. So what we are interested is in to get a better understanding of what happens in terms of the resources that we have and how we can use those resources to, to produce the goods or the services that um, we need. And this is very relevant in the field of, uh, of health economics. Um, we know that the economy is composed by households and firms and um, we need to understand and to always keep in mind that economics is the study of how households and firms make decisions under scarcity. And we always speak about scarcity in health economics because all resources are scarce because they are finite. So because something can end, it's always defined as scarce by, by economies. So when we are talking about the use of scarce resources, we are talking about um, uh, decisions and how those decisions need to um, um, comprehend how to use these uh, scarce resources um, and we need to have in mind that we are talking about trade-offs, about different uses of, um, of resources, for instance. Um, every day is 24 hours and we have different things that we can do in these 24 hours that we are given every day. So we have time for leisure, we have time for work, we have time you know, to watch TV, to read, to go to movies and so on. So we are always making um, decisions uh, with the time that we are given, uh, with the 24 hours that are scarce, and um, sometimes the, um, the different demands on our time, you know, make it um, make um, very real the, the different demands that we have, and we have to make trade-offs on our time, you know, in, in terms of what are we going to do do I work for 10 hours, you know, and spend four hours with my family, or do I have some family events and I can only work for eight hours or six and I need to, to spend more time with my family? And now with the, the, the current pandemics, what we are all um, um, observing when we are staying at home and working from home, and if we have to homeschool your kids, there are a lot of different pressures in the 24 hours that we are given in each day. And this makes very clear the trade-offs that uh, we have to do. And when we talk about trade-offs, and when we talk about trade-offs in the healthcare sector and, or trade-offs in the economy as a whole or in the country, it's just um, we are talking about the same kind of decisions, but on a, a more macro level. Um, so, economics is the study of how society manages its, its scarce resources and economists study how people make decisions, how people interact with um, one another and how, um, and we also uh, study um, how forces and trends um, affect the, the economy as a whole. So, and we can do this in, in several fields. What economists, what the health economists do is that they do this in the health economics field all the time. But one, one of the appeals of, of um, the healthcare sector, it's, um, it evolves permanently. So we always have new things to, to study. And there are also uh, a lot of um, improvements in terms of the research methods, uh, econometric, statistical analysis, and so on. So, uh, data gathering, big data, um, big data, you know, and data sets, and there are several things that um, make us uh, keep going um, with always something novel 
to bring into the field um, of research and into the field of, uh, of health economics. Um, when we make trade-offs, we have to, when we make decisions, we have to do a trade-off between one goal against the other. So in terms of society, what uh, we can think about is like, are we going to put more money on national defense or are we going to support and subsidize consumer goods or um, are we going to support cleaning a, a more clean environment or a high level of income you know, for certain groups in, in society. And something that's also very relevant and that uh, uh, became um, uh, to the top of the agenda more recently is the, are the um, um, trade-offs between efficiency and, and equality um, because the, the current pandemics has also put uh, a link um, on um, inequalities in, in societies and now um, um, more deprived groups in, in every country are being more affected by the, the coronavirus and also how this is our difference between the groups in society and also differences between um, working from home that not everyone is, is uh, able to do it due to the, the sort of work that people do and so on so the field of um, inequalities in, um, in health and also inequalities in health care driven by the social determinants of health are going to be topical in the next uh, couple of, um, of years. So efficiency, it's um, about um, the maximum benefits that we can generate for, for society from uh, scarce resources. And here we can talk about the size of the economic pie that um, very frequently is uh, can be uh, seen as the GDP, you know, and all the the, um, the forecasts for the reductions or decreasing the GDP for the next t well for 2020 and also for 2021. This is going to be um, um, a very important macroeconomic um, variable in the next couple of years because it will affect the capacity of all societies to, to make investments that are necessary and also to support um, the private groups in, um, in, um, within the countries. But we also uh, need to think about equality, so how we are sharing benefits among societies members and whether or not those are uh, uniformly distributed what was the trend uh, before a coronavirus uh, was that uh, we were uh, witnessing um, uh, an increase um, between in inequalities in, in society and also in inequalities in, in health and mortality and access to health and so on so with the current situation I think that probably the problems that we were observing before are going to be magnified in the next couple of years and we will need to have evidence uh, about what worked to support evidence-based policies and also to, to support the groups that need it the, the most. And so efficiency is about the, the size of, of the pie uh, and equity is about the, the size of, of the slice of the pie. And we have some, um, there are uh, policies and mechanisms to, to support a different in society and also to, to help the most deprived groups in order to improve their prospects um, in life and also in the, um, uh, for future uh, generations. Um, as an all, uh, for, for the economy, we think about efficient levels of, of, uh, of production um, and um, trying to get the, the most uh, as possible from the scarce resources available. We know that the money available to, to pay for health care is scarce, the money to invest in public health interventions or in, in hospitals or in um, um, uh, universal uh, health coverage is scarce. We are also aware that um, the, the number of human resources working in the healthcare sector uh, doesn't matter if we are talking about physicians, nurses, um, dentists, physiotherapists and so on, it's scarce. So we have um, a lot of thinking to do regarding how to use all these resources in a better way um, to get 
um, the most uh, out of it and also to, to improve um, the, um, the health situation of uh, the, the populations and also to increase the results of um, the healthcare that is uh, provided. Um, as economists, we also like to think about the, the production possibilities frontier, which is the, what we can do, the resources that we have available. And we need to think about human resources, but also about uh, technical resources. And this involves a trade-off because the only way to get more of one good is to get less of another good. And I'll give you an example that I think is, is quite clear to, to understand what I'm intending to say. Um, a physician, and let's think about a surgeon, he can do at least three things. He can do outpatient um, uh, appointments for, 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 his, uh, for his patients before or after the, the surgery. He can spend time on the operating room, uh, operating uh, his or her patients, and uh, he or she can also spend time on uh, A and D, attending people that arrive to A and D and that the uh, accidents uh, and so on. So the only way uh, of having uh, a surgeon doing more surgeries is if he or she has to spend less time doing outpatient visits or spend less time uh, in the A and D um, setting. So. Uh, this is a, a very basic example, but I think it conveys quite well uh, that we only can have uh, more of one good if we are doing uh, uh, less or getting less of another good. And we also have, of course, an efficient level of production when we are working not at, all, at the full uh, capacity of, of what we can do, but um, at less than that. So the cost of, of uh, something is also what we give up to do it. So um, we need to compare the, the benefits. Uh, we need to compare cost with benefits of, uh, of different uh, alternatives. And um, uh, we talk about opportunity costs in terms of the, the protection facilities frontier of what we have to give up of something in order to produce more of another good. Um, we also, um, as economists, and this is particularly relevant in, in health economics, we think about um, rational people thinking at the, at the margin. So um, rational people, and this is just um, a definition of, uh, of um, microeconomics, it's, um, it are defined as people that systematically and purposefully do the best they can to achieve the, their objectives and marginal changes are the small incremental adjustments to a plan of action. And this is very relevant because um, we need to compare the marginal benefits with the marginal costs in order to make a decision. And we only should, well, we, what we wish as uh, citizens of any given country is that the decision makers or the policy makers only take a decision if the marginal benefits of what we are getting are higher than the marginal costs of, those cor of that course of, uh, of action. We also know that people respond to incentives and we have different ways of um, um, giving incentives to people and we wish to change the behavior of someone when um, we put an incentive in, uh, in place. So higher prices can be a way of, of doing that. Uh, so if, if I put a higher price in, in a medical appointments, what we can expect is that people um, go less often to the, to the physician. And if I pay more to, to surgeons or to physicians, what I can expect is that they are willing to work more hours. Uh, in terms of public policy, incentives work to change uh, the costs or the benefits and also to change people's behavior. For instance, there has been um, a lot of discussion in terms of um, behavioral uh, economics and how that can be used in the healthcare sector in order to change people's behavior to what is uh, more desired for the society as, as a whole than in what is seen as a positive thing. So, uh, people um, interact with, the, with each other and trade can make uh, everyone better off and this is about the globalization um, and also about specialization. 
So we allow each person or country to specialize in the activities he or she does uh, best. And um, so far in globalization, uh, we had a lot of trade in, in, uh, in between countries and we have um, a lot of uh, services being localized to, to other countries. Uh, and in terms of, of the healthcare sector, for instance, in, in a given country, there are it's not unusual to have centers of excellence, for instance, for cancer care or for transplantation or um, for trauma, things like that, because we know that when someone does the same activity very often, the, the infrastructure is um, usually better suited for, for, the, for the desired outcomes that we wish to, to witness. Uh, we also, um, uh, economists um, think that markets are usually a good way to organize the, the economic uh, activity and that central planning uh, helps uh, in that. So uh, government officials are central planners and then they make all the decisions re regarding the location of scarce resources in the, in the economy they can decide what goods and services uh, are produced, how much is produced and what produced, um, produced and consumed those goods and services and so on. And in a, in a central planning framework, um, what is seen is that markets don't work that well or the government um, takes the, the role of, uh, of the market. Um, in the market economy, uh, we let the market to make decisions regarding the location of, uh, of resources and um, there are decentralized decisions of many firms and households and they interact in markets for, for goods and services and are guided by prices and um, self-interest, the, 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 the participants in the market and the, it's not uh, unusual to hear about the Adam Smith uh, invisible hand. And, um, how do we balance these two different views uh, about the central planning and the, the market in the healthcare sector? Well, both happen um, because the, the healthcare sector has very specific characteristics and some part of it sometimes um, has to be uh, centrally planned and some uh, parts of it are left to the market. So it's... Um, uh, it's not impossible, but it's not um, uh, usual that we only find one way of organizing the activity in the healthcare sector um, as uh, being left totally to the market or as being left totally to the um, central uh, government. We talk about market mechanisms and what's relevant for the economists are prices and quantities and we have what we usually um, depict, this is the market, we have a supply here, we have demand here, so the D is for demand and the DS is for supply and this is the market in, in equilibrium, so it's the Adam Smith invisible hand working, so we have producers in one side, we have buyers in the other side, and by leaving them doing what they do the best, the buyers to buy and the producers to, to produce, they will um, achieve the, the equilibrium and the, where the price that the, the sellers are wish to, to get on what they are selling equals the price of what the buyers are wishing to pay for what they are buying and the quantity that um, the buyers and the sellers wish to, to exchange is the same. So this is a market here that can be seen as, a, as in a perfect equilibrium and we have the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. Well, of course, that reality is not... Um, as uh, nice as this graph and we have different changes here and um, not always in the healthcare sector we have um, the, the invisible end uh, working. So this takes me to the, to the next point uh, or uh, where governments can sometimes improve market outcomes and this happens quite frequently in the, in the healthcare sector. So we need government in general to, to enforce the, the rules and to, to make the, um, the, the country uh, work. We also, um, and the government also maintain institutions key to the, to the market uh, economy, for instance, property rights. So uh, investors know that what they are putting in place today, you know, um, a plant or um, a shop, whatever, a restaurant, whatever, you know, 
is not going to be taken the, the, the next day by, by someone that arrives and says, no, this is mine. And um, property rights are, are important because it gives the, um, an individual the ability to own and exercise control over uh, what uh, we call uh, scarce resources. Um, the government intervention um, seeks to change the, the location of resources. So it's when it's um, realized that if we leave the interaction between the supply and demand side to the market, um, the location of resources is not efficient. Um, so we need to, to promote efficiency in order to avoid market failures. And we also need to promote equality in order to avoid disparities in economic well-being that are not acceptable for that society in particular. And this is very contextual and changes from um, country to country because the values are not the, the same uh, in every country or in every society. And of course, that these um, interactions and what uh, the, the scope of intervention that is given to, to a given government depends a lot um, about the country that uh, we are talking about. And of course, that what happens in a country is also driven by uh, all the past of that uh, specific country. So market failures are very, very relevant uh, for, for health economics because um, they um, depict the situation in which the market on its own fails to produce an efficient allocation of, of resources. And when the allocation of resources is not efficient, we are wasting. And when we are wasting uh, as a society, uh, everyone is, um, is wasting. And it means that we could do more with the resources that, um, that we have. So causes for market failures are externalities, um, the impact of one person's action on the well-being of, uh, of a bystander, for instance. And um, please excuse me if I'm uh, going back again to the current um, coronavirus pandemic, but for instance, uh, someone that is infected and is not, has not yet been admitted to the hospital and can be treated at home, if that person does not stay at home in order to protect the others uh, to be infected, this is a negative externality. Okay, and uh, of course that we expect that uh, everyone uh, has um, respect also for, for the others. Uh, um, an example of, of a positive externality is uh, vaccination. You know, it's um, uh, when I get the vaccine, not only I'm protecting myself of being infected, but I also stop the spread of a disease. So the, the social good um, to, uh, achieved by um, vaccinating one person is greater than the individual good of that person being vaccinated. And we also, uh, another reason for market failures are market power, so the ability of a single person or, or a small group to endlessly influence market prices. And this is also uh, very relevant in the healthcare sector, for instance, uh, pharma companies have market power, especially if they operate in, in fields where there are very few companies or if they, there is uh, uh, only one company producing um, um, you know, a cancer drug or something for a transplantation or a vaccine or something like that. So this is also uh, very relevant in the field of, uh, of healthcare. Um, in terms of um, disparities in economic well-being, we talk about, um, uh, for the market economy, we talk about rewards uh, for people ability to produce things that other people uh, are willing to, to pay for. Uh, and sometimes uh, people are not willing to pay for uh, something, so uh, we need to, to subsidize uh, those goods because if we just leave it to the market, the, the price is too high. Uh, for instance, um, uh, drugs for uh, orphan diseases, the price can be um, very, very high, so that, um, and also the cost of, of research are very high. So very few companies, if, if any, would be interested on, on doing research on that. Um, and we also wish to have government intervention for, for public policies in order to diminish inequalities, for instance. That's why um, education is compulsory in many countries until a certain age. Uh, 
it, it's one way of, of reducing uh, inequalities or providing uh, some goods or service access to care or to social care um, free of charge, the point of use for certain groups that are more deprived in society. However, we all know that this process is um, far from perfect, but it doesn't mean that we should give up. It just means that we need to do uh, more research, you know, and help to, to improve it. Um, and in market failures can be uh, described as an imperfection in the price system that prevents uh, an efficient allocation of, um, of resources. So the production uh, and or uh, allocation of a good or service resulting from the market is not going to be uh, efficient. Um, the situation in the healthcare sector is that um, we can find in the healthcare market all the market failures that are described. Uh, in economics. Uh, so uh, there is plenty of, of uh, things to, to do research around. So we have the nature of, of the good healthcare itself. So it's uh, healthcare, it's not uh, relevant for, for us as, um, as persons if we are not sick. Um, it's an anomogeneous and, um, and it's also interdependent in, in consumption and non-homogeneous non means that we, there are different types of health care, you know, we have uh, GP visits, we have outpatient clinics, we have um, surgeries, we have inpatient admissions, we have medicines, we have uh, physiotherapy, so there are very different things about it. And there are also some types of healthcare that we can only consume after we have used some, you know, another one, for instance. Um, if we need a prescription for uh, a medicine, we cannot uh, have the, the medicine until we have had an appointment. So one thing is, is the result of another. Externalities that I've already mentioned and the, 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 goal, the, the existence of, uh, of positive externalities, for instance, vaccination is, is particularly relevant in, in, a, in the field of healthcare. And also, um, there is a lot of uncertainty in, um, in healthcare because we don't know when we are going to, to be sick, we don't know what kind of diseases we might get. And there is also a lot of uh, um, predictability on, on, of the production results. So uh, 10 people with the same disease um, might uh, end up with uh, three or four different outcomes. So a few of them are going to die. A few of them will be completely recovered. Uh, a few of them will recover with some minor ailments and some of them will recover with some major consequences. So, this is uh, different from uh, from person to person. There is also something that is um, a symmetry of information that is very relevant in the in the field of healthcare, and the demand for care is also very different from the demand of many other goods that um, we have in um, in society. So there is an agency relationship between the, the patient and the and the physician. Uh, because we have to leave the decision making for the, the patient. We don't know um, exactly what's necessary to treat ourselves when we are sick and this leaves room for providing this demand. That's when the, the, the physician uh, might uh, make the patient to use more healthcare services than what would be uh, necessary. We also have the situations of moral hazard, um, when the, the patient, um, for, well, can be the patient, um, doesn't they have like um, uh, behaviors that are conducive of, um, uh, it's when the, the patient, for instance, might have uh, careless behaviors, for instance, uh, when uh, someone might say that the, the person is, uh, is smoking because, um, uh, she knows that if she gets sick, someone uh, will take care of her. Uh, we have cream skimming from the side of insurance companies that they only, if possible, they only would wish to, to insure um, patients that uh, would never be, be sick. And uh, also the demand for care is the derived demand for, for health because uh, at the end what people want is to have a better health, but because we cannot buy health itself, we need to, to buy um, health care. 
uh, in terms of, of market structure, we also have an imperfect market. There are lots of monopolies, oligopolies and monopsonies in the, in the, the healthcare system. Um, there are barriers to entry, it's a not-for-profit sector, there is an, an interdependence between demand and supply and all this makes the, um, the healthcare market um, very different from many other sectors in the, in the economy and it needs a different approach in terms of um, what are the, um, the models that help us to be efficient and at the same time uh, generate the, the best outcomes for, for society. The, the failures in the, in the healthcare market um, bring us, um, have uh, far-reaching implications for, for health policy in terms of equality of access to healthcare, public funding of many um, services, um, the regulation of, of health insurance. Um, most of the times, or sometimes, prices are not important at, at the, the, the moment of, of consumption. Um, physicians can be paid through salary or capitation. This has an impact in the way that they developed the, the activity and in the, the way that they work. There's also space for strong regulatory intervention by the, um, uh, by the state. Um, sorry. So the 10 principles of, uh, of economics, I have them grouped here in three, um, in three uh, subgroups, how people make decisions, how people interact and how the economy as a whole uh, works. So people face trade-offs, the cost of something is what you give up to get it, so this is opportunity cost. Rational people think at the margin, so don't forget that we need to weigh the marginal benefits against the marginal costs of, of doing something. And we also know that people respond to incentives, so we just need to get right incentives in place in order to change behaviors in what we think is the best for, for society. All people interact. Trade can make everyone uh, better off. And it doesn't matter if we are talking about a, a specific country or um, on a more global uh, economy. Markets are usually a good way to, to organize the economic activity, but in, uh, in the healthcare sector, we are also aware that governments uh, can sometimes, and I dare to say, uh, very often improve market outcomes, and that calls for a strong regulation and sometimes also a strong intervention from the government side. Uh, in terms of how the economy as a whole works, we also need to have in mind um, that the country's standard of living depends on, on its ability to produce goods and services and that's why the, the reductions that are being forecasted for GDP are so concerning for, for, the, for the near future. Prices rise when government prints uh, too much money and society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and, and uh, unemployment. However, I, I should say that this 10th um, principle is being uh, under revision as this has not really been observed in the, um, in the, very, in the last 10, 15 years. So, uh, health economics is the application of the science of economics to the phenomena and problems related to the topic of health and health care. And I think that um, with my presentation and with the, the examples that I was giving, I think I, I was able to make uh, this, uh, this clear. Um, this, um, um, are the, the key points where we see that economics apply to health and health care. So economics, um, methods apply to health because uh, there is a scarcity of society, uh, societal uh, resources. We um, have to always have in mind opportunity costs that in healthcare might be substantial. Um, and we also need to have in mind the rational decision-making process and um, health economics uh, assumes that uh, rational individuals um, act in the market and um, as in mainstream uh, uh, economics. So uh, crucial for, for health economics um, coming from the, from the economics discipline, we have the concept of marginal uh, analysis. What I was talking about, the marginal benefits being um, higher than the, the marginal costs, and this is really important for uh, decision, -making, uh, decision makers to have a, a good understanding about costs and benefits and the impact of, of their decisions um, in, um, in society. 
uh, and we also have the use of economic and econometric models, uh, for instance, or GPs, uh, labor supply, and this comes from the, the microeconomic theory. Uh, works or hospital company sh uh, competition models from um, uh, um, operations research. Economic, econometric models uh, can be used to test economic models on real data. We also um, develop empirical uh, models regarding individual behaviors, determinants of health behaviors such as smoking, drinking, food consumption, and so on. So this is um, a very rich uh, field of um, of analysis, and we also need to to evaluate the impact of of health policies in order to improve the the policy making um, process. Um, economics provides an insight uh, on how the healthcare sector works, uh, how individuals behave, uh, how scarce resources could be used to, to produce uh, healthcare services and all services could be um, accessed and uh, distributed between different people uh, in or different groups in a, in a society. There is room for rational, for rational uh, choices in health uh, and healthcare in terms of behavior of physicians, nurses and managers, for instance, patients' behavior and the role of um, uh, economic incentives in, um, in healthcare. So, um, as a way of uh, concluding, uh, health economics is defined by what health economists do. Uh, it's a rapidly evolving discipline, applies to a number of uh, economic supplies to a number of relevant health and um, healthcare issues. Uh, resources are scarce and inefficiency as a cost because we are wasting the, the scarce resources that we have. Uh, and health economics is not uh, a toolkit, it should be seen as a um, as a way to look at the problems that uh, support a more rational decision-making process together with, uh, with other sciences. And uh, there are market failures in the healthcare sector that um, make it really important, the, um, the use of, of economics in, the, in healthcare. We offer a blended learning program at, uh, at Lancaster, uh, both at PhD and uh, master's level. Um, it's an applied and varied course. Um, it applies economics to health, healthcare issues and health policy. It uh, develops skills on mixed methods in terms of quantitative and qualitative um, um, curriculum. We have a very, um, we have a group of very experienced staff. Uh, it's a very international environment. We retreat uh, students from all around the world and it can be done at your own pace in, in case if you are interested. So thank you very much for your time. I'm now uh, finishing my, my presentation and get, uh, ending over to, to Faraz. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor CEO, for this informative session. I can see a lot of positive feedback from students. And um, they are asking, can they have a copy of the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we will share that uh, after the seminar and we'll send it to everyone by email. So if you don't mind, we've got a lot of questions re uh, related to your uh, seminar. Uh, if you don't mind answering some of them. Sure, sure, uh, go ahead. Sure, let me just uh, open them. It's one of the questions from Ange is asking, what does this scarce resources mean? It it's one of the earlier questions. It means that um, we cannot do everything we wish, you know, it's like uh, hours in a day. We only have 24. It's not unusual that sometimes we wish that they had 48 hours so we could do more things in a, in a given day. So scarce resources, it's exactly that, that we don't have all the money that we wish uh, that um, uh, could be uh, used or for, for providing health care to, to everyone. So we have to make choices. We cannot save everyone that you, we would like to save forever. Great, thank you. The second question is from Sham. Uh, hi, does the volunteer work is related to the economic health or could it be part of, its, of it or relevant? Um, 
it's uh, it's very relevant because the voluntary work is what um, um, is seen in what has not a price in uh, in economics. So voluntary work most of the times is uh, is made you know just uh, because you wish to contribute for for society. So uh, a lot of times it's unpaid work is like care home carers or family carers. And uh, that is relevant because it means that we are saving resources um, to the to whoever is paying for for the care in that uh, in that sector, um, and uh, that has to be accounted for somehow. And uh, there are models that account for uh, voluntary work because also one of the characteristics of the healthcare sector is that. Um, uh, some of it is uh, not for profit, so we have to, to have mechanisms to, to address that in terms of, uh, of research. I've got a question from Basim, he's asking what should we do in order to maintain the economy with this pandemic? In order to what, sorry? Uh, what, what should we do in order to maintain the economy with this pandemic? Well, that's what we are trying. Uh, we are all trying to to come up with uh, with some good uh, ideas. I'm not. Uh, I don't dare to say solutions because it it seems it is very difficult to to reach. But um, well, the the lockdown in uh, the, when half of the population in the world uh, uh, was staying at home had very strong effects in the in the uh, in the economy as as a whole. So it will take some time to to get us back to where we were, uh, and some time can be years. I think that what we need to do now is um, uh, to have in mind the the measures that are being put in place to stop the spread of the disease, you know, and try to get back to some sort of uh, of normal, because uh, it will take some time to to have a vaccine or some other treatment for for the coronavirus and the, the, the economic activity needs to be resumed soon. Thank you. Uh, another question, define the term trade-off. Trade-off is, a, is, a ch is a, an exchange. When I do, uh, for instance, if you are here uh, listening to me, you are not um, uh, having a nice time with your friends, you know, watching something on TV. So this is a trade-off that you have made on, your on the use of your time. Okay, you came here because uh, hopefully you thought that uh, you would learn something new. And uh, so for you, the, the benefit of, of uh, being uh, with us for one hour on this webinar online, uh, the benefit was higher than the, the benefit of uh, being with your friends watching something on TV. So you did a trade-off with the use of your time. I don't know if this is uh, more explicit and easier to understand, I hope so. Thank you. Um, another question from Divika. She's asking, how can market equilibrium counterpart sustainability? Um, the, the market equilibrium is, is permanently evolving because the, um, the supply side and demand side are, are also permanently uh, evolving. Uh, what we need to have in, in terms of uh, sustain, sustainability of, uh, of systems is we need to make sure that we have uh, financial resources that um, can help us to, to strive and to, to keep going and that is the part that um, is, is more difficult. So, uh, because in, the, in uh, for instance, in, in all, in many other sectors, for instance, restaurants or coffee shops or bars or whatever, we have the supply and demand working, you know, and when something is not um, uh, uh, being profitable or being sustainable in the, in the long term, it just shuts down the doors. That's not an option uh, in the healthcare sector for, for many of the activities. So we need to, to have um, a, a broader view. And that's also when we need some intervention from the state about, uh, or, about or some intervention from the government about what needs to be uh, supported because it's crucial for the, for the health of the population. Okay, we've got so many questions, but uh, obviously I'm not going to be able to answer every everyone, but we will try to answer a few more. There's one from Muhammad Faisal is asking, is it ethical uh, health policy? 
is it ethically health policy to attract foreign patients for money, but not to invest in group healthcare system for local poor populations? If yes, how to deal with it? Um, well, ethics is um, is very personal, and uh, I th well, and also as I said, uh, it's very con contextual uh, on uh, on the, the countries where we are. It's not one size fits all, and we have to allow for, for some variation. Some things are acceptable in in some countries or in some settings, and are not acceptable to to others. And of course, it's not my role. Uh, to judge or you know, to make any judgments on, on differences that might uh, occur some some decisions that uh, might seem uh, unethical for some for, for some people and ethical for for uh, for other people so um, um, I think it uh, it depends, you know. Um, so if uh, personally I agree, I don't think that personally it is uh, it is ethical to attract and to have the means for for your patients that can pay a lot and with what uh, is is made in terms of profit, not to invest that in the local population that are deprived. Okay, but this is my um, view. You know, on the issue based on my ethical and moral standards. I'm not uh, saying that this has to be that this is the, the right view for uh, for everyone. So, and here it, of course, it depends on the, on the setting and on the on what's happening in a, in a very specific context. Okay, um, I've got a bit of a different question. Muhammad Ali is asking, as a surgeon, how can I apply theory mm -hmm. to practice and especially on research? Well, we we have uh, several um, students uh, um, in our master programs that um, are physicians, and it's um, it's always possible, you know, uh, to to come up with the, with the research idea that can be uh, implemented on uh, on what you are doing and on your own setting. You know, it can be, for instance, if you are a surgeon, it can be. Uh, different surgical approach, you know, to something. I, I don't know specifically what you do, so I, I might be saying something that it's not applicable exactly to what you are doing. Or a different anesthetic, you know, or a different recovery or a different way of assessing patients that are going, that are, that are undergoing surgery. So there are different things that can, uh, that can be done. Or instance, for instance, if you wish to have uh, incentives for your team in order to reduce um, adverse events, it's also another thing that can be done. So there are plenty of uh, theoretical uh, fields that can be used, you know, in, in what you are doing in order to collect data from your practice to give uh, light, you know, uh, in order to confirm or not some theory that has been developed in the past. Okay, great. Um, maybe we'll answer another couple of questions before we move to Kirsten. So one of the question, um, how does a country like India, that's a question from Anutama, how does a country like India manage uh, scale resources considering a country's standard of living depends on the goods and services uh, it produces in response to the COVID-19? Well, um, I, I don't know much about the, the answer of, of COVID-19 in, in India. I've, I've, heard, uh, I've read a bit about what happened in Kerala. It seemed that it went extremely well. Uh, but overall, the, um, the, the results in India have not been so good. But um, what can we say? It, it, they also have not been good in the United States or in the UK, you know. So it's not only um, relevant to have means, you know, and to have uh, resources there. It seems that there are many other things at play in order to, to have a, a better answer to, to COVID-19 because some uh, countries as... I don't like very much talking about poor countries, uh, but low and middle income countries uh, like Vietnam um, did better than uh, other countries with uh, much more resources. So I think it's, it's the balance. It's not only resources, so it's not, um, a lot of times it's not only about money, it's also about leadership and evidence based policies, you know, that inform um, the decision making process. And it seems that in some countries, the, the, the policies that were implemented to, to lead with COVID-19 were better 
in some other countries in spite of the money that uh, that was available okay one last question from huda i just wanted to know if the job uh, of health economist involves making the decision of how the resources is being distributed or only study the market and provide info for the decision makers uh, it depends on your job you know you can end up being a minister of health and in the case that if you that you become a minister of health or a, you know or a member of, of a government then you have the decision making process to to apply what you've been uh, studying uh, a lot of times uh, the, the role of uh, of health economists is a technical role uh, supplying um, better information for the decision making process but we should not forget that the decision making process is political okay and at the end all the decisions are political so the the best that we can do is to have um, good research uh, based on on good principles um, ethical research and then just hope for the best thank you very much professor um, I, I, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. Obviously, there's so many questions still coming uh, live now. So, uh, obviously, because of the time uh, restraint. But um, we will send you the PowerPoint after the seminar to your email. So you can have a look and maybe benefit from any information that you, you may have missed. So uh, I'll um, move now to uh, Kirstin, uh, would you like to answer some questions rela related to studying in Lancaster University? Uh, I think you're on mute. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I've answered a few questions in the Q&A, the, the ones I was able to answer, um, while the, uh, the ones that weren't so specific to the actual presentation, so about some of the programmes that we have and um, the backgrounds for those. Um, are there any um, that you want to put to me now from the... Q and A. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to give you a few questions. I'm not sure if you've answered them already. Um, they want to. Somebody, Ermin, want to know about uh, master studies uh, at Lancaster. How is it going? I mean, are we going to go ahead with September intake? And okay, uh, so, the, so the plan at the moment is that we will be commencing programs on the first of October, as per usual. Um, in terms of the format of delivery, obviously there are different planning scenarios in place at the moment, depending on what restrictions we have at that time. Um, so it may be that some classes, some of the like larger lectures may have to be delivered online still, but we would hope to still to have some face-to-face -face teaching for smaller groups. Um, but we will need to make sure that we adhere to any social distancing policies that are in place at the time, um, at the start of term. So, um, as you can imagine, it's not absolutely confirmed exactly what each and every programme is going to look like in terms of delivery at the moment, but there are lots of different planning scenarios going on. Okay. Um, there's another question from Amjad. Uh, what are the careers fields available for master's degree in health economics? Okay, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question, so I'll pass back to, uh, to Sue. Uh, there is, uh, well, there is... Um, Health economists are a scarce resource in the world, so there is more demand for, for health economists than the supply of, uh, of health economists in the, in the world. Uh, you can do plenty of things. You can, do, uh, you can work uh, in consultancy companies, you can work uh, in, the, in the pharma industry, and both these places, well, both these sectors pl uh, pay quite well. Um, and this is independent of, uh, of the country. We also can work for international um, institutions uh, like the WHO, uh, World Bank, uh, you know, um, a, uh, the European Bank for Development, Asian Bank for Development. So there are a lot of, of roles that you can, uh, you can uptake. And also, of course, the, the public sector in, uh, in any country, public health sector, you know, there are many, many areas where, where health economists are, are required and uh, um, some, uh, some roles in the private sector, well, I'd say most of the roles in the private sector are quite, quite well paid. Thank you. Um, a question from, um, there's a question about scholarship options. There's any scholarship options for students? 
Is that in a particular course area or program? Yeah, I, mean, I haven't specified in the question. Okay, so at master's level, um, there are scholarships available for international students, but it is dependent on the department. So each academic department will have its own budget for scholarships. They're usually awarded based on merit, so there's not an additional application that needs to be made. They would be awarded at the point of application. So we usually advise students who are looking for a scholarship to advise as early in the cycle as possible um, to ensure the best chance of securing a scholarship. Um, as obviously as the time progresses through the cycle, the scholarships get allocated and there's um, fewer and fewer available towards the end of a, um, a cycle. So um, it's difficult to say without knowing exactly what department or programme we're looking at, exactly what level of scholarship would be available, but there should, there's information on the faculty web pages and in the department, um, the school's web pages as well on, the, on our website. Um, another question from um, Ange asking which courses other than this your university provide to students? So if you can give us a little bit of uh, introduction of different departments and courses available. Departments. So um, Lancaster is a comprehensive university. So we have four faculties, um, including the Faculty of Health and Medicine. So in addition to that, we have the Arts and Social Sciences, Science and Technology and Lancaster University Management School. So within those four faculties, there are a very wide range of programmes available um, at master's level. Um, I, I best, the best resource would be the web pages. Again, there's an A to Z of courses on there and there's detailed information about each of the programmes that we have. If there's a specific specific area that you're interested in, um, we'd be happy to follow up with sending some more information about that. Thank you very much. Um, one of the questions is IELTS uh, um, compulsory to study at Lancaster University? So for any students um, applying for a programme at Lancaster, we would need evidence of English language ability, um, depending on which um, education qualification you come from. We, we might ask for IELTS or we might use another qualification that you have already completed. Um, but yes, I mean, in terms of getting a visa to come to the UK, international students are required to um, demonstrate their ability to, to study in English at a certain level. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll have one more question regarding uh, the fees. How much does it normally cost for, um, you know, master course or maybe undergraduate course in Lancaster University? Okay, it does range. Again, it varies from between the different faculties um, and different subject areas. Um, in the management school, um, a lot of programmes range between 20 and £22,000 at master's level. At undergraduate level, they, they tend to vary from about 16,000 to 20,000 pounds per year, depending on the subject. So th there is a bit of variation. Again, you can, the individual programmes list the fees associated with them on the web pages. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, do you have any information you would like to share about the pre-sessional English as well for students who have a slightly lower IELTS. Okay, so we have 10 week and four week pre-sessional programs depending on the IELTS, the, the IELTS score. So for students who are one point below the requirement, we would um, offer them the 10 week pre-sessional course. For half a point below, it would be the four week um, English for Academic Purposes program. And um, um, they are available um, this year, they're being delivered online. Um, usually they're delivered on campus um, prior to the start of term in October. Um, but yes, there are, there are options available there. There are also some longer pre-sessional programmes for students who need to um, up their English level by a little bit more. They, do, they, they aren't available on every single programme and every single faculty. So again, it would need, we'd need to just have a little bit more information to be able to advise clearly on which options would be available. Thank you very much, Kirstine. Did you like to add anything, any more information before we finish? Um, just to say that thank you to everybody who's participated today and thank you for joining us. And if you do have any uh, further questions for us, please do let IEC Abroad know and they'll pass them on to us and, and we'd be happy to answer them. 
Thank you very much for today, everyone. And thank you for Professor Sue and Kirstine. If you guys have any more questions regarding uh, studying at Lancaster or regarding this seminar, please get in touch with us. Uh, you've got our contact details and emails and we'll be happy to get back to you with the uh, answers. And uh, as we promised, we will send you the certificate after uh, the end of this uh, seminar uh, by email. And uh, we will also attach the PowerPoint um, presentation for your own references. So thank you very much, guys, and we will be looking to see you again in the next seminar in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, thank and have you. a nice day. Bye.